Guys, welcome to the show. My name is Jerry Miller. Thank you kindly for joining us Monday on the I Love Seville show. This is 12, uh, Monday, October 26th. We're live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world. A lot we're going to cover on today's program, including J.C. Penney being sold at Fashion Square Mall. We're going to talk about um, that sale, which we predicted a couple weeks ago right here in this very chair. We're going to talk shopping centers in Charlottesville. We'll rank them. Keith Smith gave me this whiteboard right here. Maybe we'll put it into action today on the program. New construction and the impact of new construction in Charlottesville. We are curious to see what that impact is going to be and how COVID may have influenced or changed what was coming down the pipe from a new construction standpoint. That topic on the program. Apple launching new AirPods this you know, holiday season, turn of the calendar 2021, the AirPods, a new profit center for Apple. We'll talk about the announcement from this company today on the program. The chicken sandwich wars are very much a reality as we head into Q4. That's the influence of Popeyes on today's program. A lot of UVA news, including the Wahoo football team following to falling to Miami. UVA now 1-4, same day Virginia Tech falls to Wake Forest. In a bit of an upset, the Hokies now outside the top 25. We'll talk about those ball games as well. And right now, I'm looking at the uh, the big screen in the in the studio and read across the board um, on Wall Street the volatility that comes from an election year and an election right around the corner. I mean, guys, it's October 26. What are we talking? Eight days away now from the election. Have you thought about that? We're eight days away from the election, the, the market's volatile, and add the wrinkle of stimulus talks looking like it's not really going to be a, a reality, certainly not before the election, and, and, and stock markets are reeling right now. So welcome to the program. Give the show a like and a share anywhere you're watching. That would mean the world to us. Judah Wickhauer is our director. Judah, if we can give some love to interstate pest and service companies. A four-generation strong business, interstate pest and service companies, really making a positive impact on this community. More than 50 years of positive impact in Charlottesville, in Central Virginia, and much of the Commonwealth. Interstate pest and service companies, truly a home's best friend. The lead of today's show is something we predicted a couple weeks, maybe about a month ago on the program. J.C. Penney, the property is sold. Allison Rabel from the Daily Progress has this story. Penny and uh, J.C. Penney in Charlottesville Fashion Square Mall. You see what's happening to this shopping center. It's slowly eroding away, piece by piece by sale or by tenants just sprinting away from the mall and, 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 and leaving their leases. Fashion Square Assets is the new owner. That's um, a, a company under Seminole Trail Management, which is a local property management company. This was quite a purchase by Seminole Trail Management. In fact, this purchase, the J.C. Penney site, 10.17 acres, oh, re worth repeating, 10.17 acres in Almoral County, $4.5 million gets you this piece of property. This is um, a very recognizable, a very noticeable um, piece of real estate. And four and a half million dollars, it's now owned by a local firm. We'll follow closely. The local firm straight up said in the newspaper article, we have no plans yet for this particular JCPenney location. We saw this as an opportunity um, to buy distressed asset, and the opportunity was too good to pass up. We're going to hold on to this distressed asset for a little while as we determine where the market is going, the impacts of COVID and this pandemic, and the impacts of, of, of this pandemic on what it's going to do to consumer confidence. So it's, gonna, it's a hold. It's a long-term play for uh, this, this local business, Seminole Trail Management, and $4.5 million shows they're cash-rich, for you to invest four and a half million into a property and hold it for a little while shows that you have a little bit of burn rate on your side. This immediately got me thinking about the uh, top shopping centers in Charlottesville. From an opportunity standpoint, we talk real estate on this program often because it's, uh, it's what we do for a living. We are uh, two businesses. We are an advertising agency and a real estate investment company. 
And it got me thinking of the top shopping centers in the area. And I'm going to bust out a whiteboard here given by my friend Keith Smith, who's going to be, come on, who's going to be joining us on the program at about 105, 110. Keith, I'm curious if your take of the top shopping centers in the area. I think it's a clear cut for me who's number one. But I'm curious of your take. Put it in the feed. Put it in the feed of what the best shopping centers from your dollar are in Charlottesville City. For me, a clear cut number one from a shopping center standpoint is Barracks Road. And I don't think it's even close. I think Barracks Road is your clear cut number one shopping center uh, in Charlottesville. And I'm going to extend this to Albemarle County. I think that line between the city of Charlottesville and Albemarle County, no one knows. So we'll include Almoral County shopping centers um, into this ranking. I, you know, from a, a, a next standpoint, I think there's a noticeable drop. And it's painful for me to say this because I own real estate in downtown Charlottesville. I think previously downtown Charlottesville was a clear cut too, but perhaps downtown Charlottesville not as clear cut um, a two from a shopping district as they used to be. Downtown Charlottesville has significant vacancy. Um, whether it's an accurate perception or not, some see downtown Charlottesville as having a parking issue, and some see downtown Charlottesville as having rents a bit too high for the current market. As a result, you see a vacancy rate that's pretty significant in downtown Charlottesville. That being said, what would you rank from the second best Charlottesville, second best shopping center, Almora County? You know what? Let's just get ballsy. Top shopping centers in Central Virginia. Let's get a little ballsy. What are the top shopping centers in Central Virginia? This will allow me to include Chris Henry's development in uh, Zion's Crossroads, well, where El Mariachi is, Mariachi, um, a fantastic Mexican restaurant. We'll include that in there. All the ones down Route 29, Forest Lakes, Holly Mead, we can include there. What are the top five shopping centers in Central Virginia? That's a question that I have for you. I'm going to add to my ranking. I see comments coming in already. We will get to your comments. I mean, I think even though we have vacancy like we do, I mean, we have tremendous vacancy at Fifth Street Station. We have tremendous vacancy at Stonefield. We have tremendous vacancy at all the shopping centers along Route 29. Okay? So the vacancy on the downtown mall, while concerning, it's indicative of the other shopping centers out there as well. We have vacancies uh, at the Zions Crossroads Shopping Center. So there's, there's vacancy. I'm going to say still second is the downtown mall from a shopping corridor standpoint, Judah Wickhauer. So the downtown mall in the two slot, that's still in the two slot for me. You may disagree. We'll talk about this with Keith Smith. From a three slot, I mean, everything after one and two, completely up in the air. Right? I mean, where do you put in the three, four? I think the gap between first, Barracks Road, and second, in my opinion, the downtown mall, is a sizable gap. However, the gap between number two, the downtown mall, and three, four, and five, that gap is even larger than the gap between one and two. From a shopping corridor standpoint, shopping district, is the UVA corner three? Do we put the UVA quarter in the three slot? That's a question I have for you. Is this a legitimate top three? Judah, you got something to say? I mean, I'm curious. Judah Wickhauer is our director. Here, one shot on me. Is this what the top three looks like from a shopping district standpoint? I'm curious of your opinion. I'll put this as the top three for now. Shopping quarter, shopping districts, shopping centers, Barracks Road 1, the downtown mall, UVA corner 3, downtown mall 2, Barracks Road 1, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded. I'll tell you what my 4 and 5 are as the show matures a little bit. I want to get to some more headlines. Put the comments, put your vote for the top shopping center in the, uh, in the, in, in the comments section. We'll relay it on air. Now, my, my next topic is sports tournaments in Charlottesville. I've touched on this briefly. Over the weekend, I played in a pickleball tournament in Henrico also in the Richmond area. And this pickleball tournament attracted pickleball players from 13 different states. It was men's and women's. Very entry-level players, all the way to some players at the top that were semi-pros, 
you can make an argument some pro pickleball players. The reason I bring this to you is not to dissect the game of pickleball, although I think it's a phenomenal sport. It's America's fastest growing sport is pickleball. But the reason I bring this to you and bring this up to you is I think if we're going to get this local economy, the Charlottesville, Central Virginia economy, the Almoral County economy, Fluvanna, Louisa, Nelson, Green County economies back going in the direction we want, we need to be creative and entrepreneurial. And how we get creative and entrepreneurial is we think about ideas outside the box. I'm going to go to the whiteboard again. Keith Smith, I'm really liking this whiteboard here. How do we get creative, entrepreneurial in Seville? So I'm going to create another whiteboard. And hotels are in trouble. Tourism we're worried about. Weddings and hospitalities we're worried about. We're uncertain what's going to happen in the winter with restaurants and retail. We know with the cold coming that this could impact food and beverage. So ideas I have for our local municipality to drive tax revenue. Here are my ideas. One of the ideas I have, sports tournaments. And I can speak firsthand about this because I was just in one in Richmond. So if we're able to have an emphasis on sports tournaments in this area, soccer, basketball, baseball, pickleball, we have the facilities already. If we're able to create a Charlottesville pickleball championship, some kind of soccer tournament through SACA, partner with UVA in some capacity with basketball, baseball, or football, these types of events will drive hotel bookings. These types of events will get people from outside the area coming to Charlottesville, and it will create incremental revenue, which is what we need for our municipalities. So one of the things I'm trying to emphasize with Albemarle County Board of Supervisors, with Charlottesville City Council when talking with them, is the need to emphasize creative outside-the-box ideas that can get folks from outside the area doing things safely. And right now, safely is outside doing stuff outside. How you combat the winter is doing out things outside where you're sweating and you're being active. So putting an emphasis on this like sports tournament concept, I just experienced one over the weekend in Richmond and in Rico, can have a very strong impact on the community. So I think we should emphasize outside activities for Almoral County, the city of Charlottesville, and Central Virginia in totality. This could be hiking. This could be sports tournaments, mountain biking. We have mountain biking trails everywhere. We could create a tournament or a race on the Rivanna Trail, a race across Charlottesville and Almaro County on the Rivanna Trail. Maybe it's a biking, running type of race, okay? These ideas will get folks from outside Virginia, outside Charlottesville and Central Virginia, coming here with open wallets. And that's what we need right now because if we don't get creative, the supervisors in your municipality, the counselors in your municipality will start saying next year, we need to raise taxes to make up this budget deficit. And that's when we're really going to start feeling stinks. Our next headline, and, and give me your top shopping centers in the area. Put them in the Coppin section. I want to hear from you. Right now, I think Barracks Road is the number one shopping center in central Virginia. All of Central Virginia, the number one shopping center is Barracks Road. The number two shopping quarter, district, center, and all of Central Virginia, I would say, is the downtown mall. Number three, the UVA corner. What's four and five? Do you disagree with my top three? Put it in the feed. The next headline comes from a trend we predicted and is continuing to happen. Apple, I think, is a stock that's going to boom and pop. We have the iPhone 12 coming out. We have 5G. We're going from 4G to 5G on the networks. People want the nicest, the newest, the shiniest, and the brightest. The new Apple iPhone 12 will be sold to you and I without AirPods, AirBuds. There's going to be no listening. There's going to be no headphones. You're going to have to buy those separately. Apple is also not going to include a charger. You'll get the cable, but you won't have the plug. So those are two profit centers. 
that it's already creating. The plug into the wall that you have to buy and the AirPods you're going to have to buy on top of the new phone that's coming out, the 12, and the new network that's being rolled out, 5G. I think this stock over the next six months is going to explode, certainly heading into the holiday season. You add the wrinkle of COVID, keeping people even more inside and on electronic devices, and I, see, I think you see a stock that's going to pop. About a month ago, it did a stock split and made the stock more approachable than ever before. I think you're going to see a, a spike. You heard it here. Okay? Another item that we were following on the show, and we have a lot of people voting for the shopping center topic. We'll get to your perspective here in a matter of moments. Mercy Best is going to join us on the program in about seven minutes. Seven minutes for Mercy Best. Uh, fantastic entrepreneur on today's program. James Watson, we will get to your comments. Meredith Young, we will get to your vote for Shopping Center. Um, Neil Williamson, we will get to your comments on sports tourism. Barbara Lundgren, we will get to you as well. Orion Farouk, the musician, we will get to you on the show. Um, thank you for sharing your perspective. Before we do, this is an interesting macro trend we've followed, and we've seen it impact Charlottesville. So you know there's Fried Chicken Alley in Seaville, and that's that fried, that's that Bojangles, that, 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 that Popeyes, that Kentucky Fried Chicken, that Raising Cane's, Zaxby's, um, and soon-to-be Chick-fil-A. So within one mile, I'm going to write them down. Within one mile, you know what another name for this Another name for Fried Chicken Alley in the city of Charlottesville is the Cock Block. The Cock Block. That's not vulgar. A chicken can also be called a cock. That is not vulgar. It's called the Cock Block. So Fried Chicken Alley, also called the Cock Block. You have KFC. You have Bojangles. You have Raising Cane. You have Zaxby's, soon to be Chick fil A, and Popeyes. So you have six chicken centric businesses all within one mile on the cock block KFC, Bojangles, Raising Cane's, Zaxby's, Chick fil A, and Popeyes. And on the cock block, you have and this is a macro trend as well. This is not unique to Charlottesville. This has happened from a macro standpoint. You have six businesses all going toe-to-toe -to -toe in what is being dubbed by Wall Street and F&B insiders, fast food insiders, as the fried chicken sandwich wars. From a, fry, from a fast food standpoint, the brands have made their name on one iconic item, McDonald's. It's one iconic item is the Big Mac. That's what McDonald's, its iconic item, menu item, is the Big Mac. Wendy's, okay, uh, take Burger King. Its iconic item is the Whopper. Panera Bread, the Jacksons, okay, they're fantastic with Panera Breads locally. Panera Bread, iconic item, the broccoli and cheddar bowl, most likely. Fast food joints and fast casual make their reputation on an iconic item. I've given you some examples. These six, KFC, Bojangles, Raisin Cane, Zaxby's, Chick-fil-A, and Popeye's are in a battle from a fried chicken sandwich wars. And it started by Popeye's. Popeye's rolled out a fried chicken sandwich, the other five now fighting with Popeye's to go after it. So I, I, I bring this question up to you. And the reason I bring this question up to you, um, I've oftentimes said on the program, the most saturated business categories in this market are restaurants. The second most saturated real estate category in Central Virginia, probably real estate agents. Those are the two most competitive business categories or industries in Central Virginia from my standpoint. Restaurants, one. Real estate agents, two. Very competitive niches. Very competitive industries. If you broke down restaurants... One of the very competitive subsets of those is the cock block. These six within a mile apart, they're fighting to see who's going to survive this battle. 
And that fried chicken sandwich, in a lot of ways, is going to determine the winner of the cock block in Charlottesville, and it's going to determine the winner nationally as well. I love these macro storylines that have a local feel and flavor as well. We'll get to Mercy Best in a matter of moments. Before we do, we'll get to your comments here on the show. Put your comments in the comment section if you have anything to say. We're happy to relay it on air. Um, Barbara Lundgren um, chiming in on the show. Love Barbara Lundgren. Barracks Road, she says, an all-time original and one of the best. Not enough parking and non-COVID. They filled parking spaces with fast food that are now empty. Please don't build, restore any more shopping centers. Build a conference center. That's from Barbara Lundgren. James Watson talks about sports tourism as well. If we're going to get this back on track sooner than later, I'm going to say it again. If we're going to get Charlottesville and Central Virginia back on track faster than other municipalities, faster than other regions and other areas, sports tourism is going to have to be front and center. This is why sports tourism is important. It brings families, parents and children from outside the area to this area, oftentimes for Friday night, Saturday night, and sometimes Sunday night hotel stays. We have a phenomenal sports department in the University of Virginia, a phenomenal athletic department that has global and certainly national recognition. We're the reigning basketball champions of, 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 the, of, of the NCAA, okay? We have phenomenal facilities. We have SACA, the, the soccer organization, the Charlottesville Area Soccer Organization, SACA, in here. They have deep pockets, big-time donors, and, and, and legitimate infrastructure, Okay? Sports tourism, as Neil Williamson has put in the feed from the Re Free Enterprise Forum, can have a massive impact on the region. If we can get our boards of supervisors, Albemarle County, and our city, Charlottesville city councilors, working in cohesion, in conjunction together to emphasize sports tourism, this is how we can start stimulating growth. Olivia Branch, KFC has closed, not sure if remodeling or closed, but it ain't open. She is right. KFC is remodeling from what I'm hearing, not closed. Remodeling from what I'm hearing. Julian Freeman says it's the chicken strip. Julian Freeman, I love the chicken strip as well. I love Fried Chicken Alley. But the cock block might be the best moniker I've heard for those six chicken-centric businesses within a mile. James Watson has this to say in the feed. Seville should definitely host future NCAA men's basketball tournaments post-COVID or even do a bubble this year during COVID, similar to Greensboro and Raleigh. Charlottesville is way more attractive to visit than Greensboro. I agree. I agree. Aren't you surprised that we're not emphasizing sports tourism more in this area? I certainly am. Think about the benefits. Goodness, I'm using two whiteboards right now. Think about the benefits of sports tourism. Shoot, I'm going to have to get some, uh, I guess I'm going to have to use this eraser. I need some Windex over here, Judah. Can you get me some Windex for this white, white, white board? Um, think about the benefits of sports tourism, okay? You're outside. If there's any more COVID-centric or COVID-friendly business model, I can't think of anything more than sports tourism that's outside-focused, right? Sports tourism also caters to moms and dads and kids. You see what I'm saying? Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Judah. This is the business models that are succeeding right now. Sports tour. I mean, are we gonna make are we gonna make a push right now um, in COVID for? And I love conference centers. Okay, don't get me wrong. The area drastically needs a conference center, but it's gonna be hard sell to get 400, 300, 200 executives inside, right? That's a tough sell. Sports tourism is not a tough sell during COVID. You see what I'm saying? We'll talk about some of the ideas with the distinguished gentleman, Keith Smith. I need to get to Mercy Best. Mercy, if you're watching, we're going to get to you shortly. And by shortly, I mean five seconds on the program. Put your comments in the comment section. Dictate the pace of tempo. Let me know your thoughts on the topics we've been covering on today's program. I will relay them on air. Jude, I have Mercy Best on the line here. 
A lot we're going to cover with her. Ooh, I like your backdrop, Mercy. Um, I'm going to I'm going to get the green light here for my director to get you on. Okay, you're on screen. He's giving me the green light. Uh, so I heard from you from Crystal. Crystal was yeah. like, "Jerry, Mercy's a rock star, and we got to get Mercy on the show." I'm like, "Crystal, you're a rock star, and if you think Mercy's a rock star." then that's all I need to hear. And here we are, and you got this like fantastic background here. I love when folks come on the show with backgrounds. Before we talk shop, yeah. before we talk shop, how about an introduction for you? You got a lot of people watching. Who's Mercy Best? So I am a daughter, a sister, a friend, um, but right now my title is a PhD candidate. So I'm studying here at the University of Virginia. I'm studying Alzheimer's disease, actually. And I'm working in the Department of Pharmacology doing that. But also, I am the founder of Steam Kits, um, which is an education startup company. And then I also am the co-founder of Steam Tricks. And so that's my shirt that I'm rocking right now. Um, this was our initial project. Um, and now we're kind of shifting to the product world. <laughs> Mercy, do you sleep? I do. You sleep? And that's <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I started taking Saturdays off. So Saturdays, I don't even open my laptop, and I get a lot of rest. Um, but yeah, surprisingly, yes, I do sleep. And um, since I study the brain and neuroscience, I'm always preaching about the importance of sleep um, because it is just it's the it's the magic cure for everything. Sleep. <laughs> you are an absolute rock star. So much I want to unpack with you here. Would you say you're a student first? or an entrepreneur first, a scientist mm -hmm. and a researcher first? How would you characterize yourself? Oh, that is a tough question. Um, right now, I will say that I am a scientist and researcher first, and I think that is kind of the cheat answer because it encompasses all of those different categories you just mentioned. So as a scientist and a researcher, I'm constantly exploring and learning new things and one of those new things I am exploring is entrepreneurship and also this student role as a PhD candidate. I love it. I love it. So how did you get to, uh, how did we get to this point? Was there, was there an aha moment? Was there always motivation for higher education? Give us a little background. Yeah, so actually my maternal grandmother, she had actually passed of Alzheimer's disease. But before she started showing symptoms of the neurodegeneration, she always said every family needs a doctor and a lawyer, and that lawyer is going to be you. And so my whole life, I grew up thinking I was going to be a lawyer. <laughs> I was in all the history courses, um, always trying to debate people to see if, you know, I could really hold that title. Um, but I was introduced to science um, in middle school through this um, after school, like summer um, immersion program that was called Math and Science Investigators. And what they would do is they would take local middle school students to the University of Richmond. And we would actually take the next grade up courses. So um, if you're in sixth grade, you'll take seventh grade science and math over summer. Um, but I was double advanced because my mom put us in summer school. So I was already in like eighth grade math. And so they had no class for me to take. And so while I was going to the eighth grade, they allowed me to work in a research lab. And so I got to actually become a scientist for a summer, and I worked with fruit flies as a model for the human brain. And from that experience, I was like, science is a career? I, I had never met a scientist. I didn't see anyone that looked like me that was a scientist, but it started to pique my interest. And so after a while, I kept going um, and doing research over the summer, and then I learned that you have to get a PhD for that. So I always knew um, that I wanted a PhD, and I actually was able to go straight from undergrad. I did my undergrad at the College of William and Mary, and I transitioned right into UVA to start my PhD work. So my parents did always preach higher education, but I never thought about science as a career growth. Amazing. Out. You are absolutely amazing. Do you think about this, um, the significance of what you are doing for the next generation? That may, that may be looking at you and be like, hey, if she can do it, then I can do it. Because when someone's thinking, and I'll cut to the chase, when someone's probably thinking researcher and scientist, what are they thinking? What's the demographic of the majority? Right, go right yeah, there. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, not me. And so I love that you mentioned that because 
that's what my my mission is all about is that uh, representation does matter um and i do believe you have to see even though i never saw it i've always saw it in my mind of like okay i'm good at this and then these are skill sets that i have so i can communicate i can talk in front of people i can also have this artistic mind where I'm designing my slides and my research presentations. So it all made sense for me to become a scientist, but I just had to get that early introduction to science as a career, and that transformed my whole trajectory. Like I said, I was going to go to law school and <laughs> become a lawyer, um, but once I fell into science, it really made sense for me, and not only me, my sister um, followed in my footsteps, and she's a computer scientist. Wow. And so it does really matter. Um, and I do sometimes feel that pressure, like you said, of you know being that representation. But I always do say for the back of my mind, um, there is this saying, I think it was from Michelle Obama, of lifting as we climb. So it's like a lot of the times I'm trailblazing and I'm you know the first person in these positions. But as I go up, I'm always telling others, okay, you can do it too. I'm doing it now. It's hard. It's challenging. But what is it? You know? Dude, you are awesome. You are so awesome. <laughs> I love this lady so much. Throw this question to you here. COVID has impacted us in so many different ways. One of the ways it's impacted us is it's changed education and how we learn. Another way it's impacted us is it's putting a lot of pressure on, on women as they try to climb in business. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the responsibility for raising children has fallen on, fall on the shoulders of women. As a result, the prioritization for career versus family is a crossroads that a lot of folks are going through right now. So my question to you is, COVID-19, um, your business and what you have behind you, how are you utilizing um, these, the, how are you utilizing your business to help make sure COVID-19 is not going to set back um, generations of kids um, in their learning and in their curriculum? Right. Um, that is an excellent question. What I always say as the tagline right now is we are reimagining education. And not only are we reimagining education, we anticipated this problem. I, I kid my family all the time. I'm like, I literally predicted the coronavirus. I really did. Because as I was building these at-home kits, the pandemic just started to emerge. And so when I was actually conceptualizing this business, a lot of people didn't see the value of it. Many people told me, oh, that's cute. But like, you know, that that's not a problem. Like that wasn't a, a, a impressing problem to have resources at home to continue learning and exploring and but as the pandemic emerged and people were locked at home and trying to figure out okay will we send our students back to school or will we do the virtual learning um and these these computer times kids sitting at the screens is just not healthy and it's not working and a lot of people are just yearning for a solution and steam kits can stand in that gap as a solution because what we're providing here are hands-on learning tools, empowering curriculum that is research-based, and then we're affirming students' interests. So we're not saying, oh, you have to become a scientist. We're saying, oh, you like to explore, you like these different things. We can merge all of these so you don't have to choose science or arts. You can do both. And a lot of times when we think of the traditional school setting, it's everything is in silos. We have our science time, tech, our math time, our history time, but that's not gonna work as these students are on the screens for hours and hours. So we need an integrated framework and that's what STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics can provide. So we're not just doing one subject at a time, we're doing them all, and the kids are really excited because it's relevant and it's engaging. Um, I love it, dude. I, I love I love this. What do you think the uh, What do you think school looks like ten years from now? Ten years from now, school has to look like kids outside. You know, really hands on learning because this technology is great, and I love what it's doing. But there needs to be some platform where we can integrate the technology piece, but those kids can still get those hands-on experiences. Um, just by, with, you know, with the STEAM kits, for example, 
Uh, one of the activities is a chemistry experiment. So we're encouraging them to become chemists, not just, oh, you can become a scientist one day. No, be a scientist right now. And you're going to turn this liquid into a solid and then you're going to make ice cream, right? So we're making it fun. We're making it engaging and hands on. And we do incorporate somewhat of a technology piece where we do have um, the instructions online on a platform. So I see school half and half. So technology, yes, but then hands on learning. And so if this coronavirus pandemic does persist, I would definitely encourage schools to consider using outside classrooms. So like socially distancing the desk while, uh, while the weather will permit, you know, it's getting a little sure. cold right now. So this won't last forever. But we have to figure out a way to get the kids back outside, back um, in somewhat of a community, in a state. Do we think, I'm going to throw another question to you about this. You've given this a lot of thought, obviously. Do we think that the education is going to now come to the child? And what I mean by that, um, maybe it's the neighborhood pod, maybe it's the teachers or the education virtually coming to the kid at their, because the concept of, the concept yes. of, say, just talk schools. We're sending children mm -hmm. to old buildings, old buildings that are not clean, that have terrible ventilation, that are extremely expensive to upkeep. It just seems like when we look yes. at it that way, an extremely antiquated model. The alternative could be much like food coming to the consumer in their neighborhood, education coming to the consumer, which is the student. And the second part of my question is, maybe we need to look at education much more like it was a for-profit business. I'm going to get out of your way on those two mm -hmm. topics. Anywhere you want to go, Mercy, on those two topics. Okay. So I love those two topics, and I love that train of thought. So my mom is my co-founder for my first business, which was called Steam Tricks. And so that was an in-person program. We would partner up. My mom is an educator with over 20 years of classroom experience and as an administrator. And so I bought my science background. She bought her education expertise. And we would go into communities just like you were speaking of. We would go into boys and girls clubs, libraries, local churches, and actually be that hands-on you know, person encouraging the kids to explore and do these activities in groups, right? And so my mom had always joked that we should get a bus and just have like almost, you know how they have those blood drive buses where they go into communities, but we would go into communities and provide them with, you know, education. Like a food enrichment. truck almost. And yes. That's yes. a great idea. That's a great <laughs> idea. Truck for education. Yes. And that's kind of what they're doing right now with busing the lunches to different students. And so, you know, an idea could be to bus steam kits to different students so that they can pick them up with their, um, their lunch for the day. And so that is exactly how I see it going. Because also one thing that we've done with the traditional academic setting is we put too many students in a classroom. So these teachers are overwhelmed. And what we already know from tons of research is that every student is different. Every student has different needs. And so the, the example that you bring of these community pods will provide that more individualized learning. Um, it will give that teacher, uh, you know, that comfort that they are making difference. You know, if they have a group of five students, that difference can be more clearly displayed versus a group of 20, 25, upwards of 30 students. And it's just overwhelming and no one's really benefiting from that. But if we do take that community pod approach of going into communities and providing them with the resources that they need, the ones that are relevant to them, I think it would just be a lot more fruitful because we'll be learning for the sake of learning and exploring and getting to the heart of the student's needs. God, this is blowing my mind. This is amazing. All right, I'm going to ask you a few more questions. Crystal Napier, thank you for setting up this interview. She is absolutely amazing here. Yes, thank you so much, um, Crystal. Do you, what scares the HE double hockey sticks out of you um, with education in this pandemic? And then the second part of the question, what makes you really excited about the innovation and changes you're seeing with education due to this, this pandemic? So what frightens you first, and then we'll end with the positive, Mercy. Yeah. So my biggest fear is that it will just continue to exasperate um, some of the, the inequities that we already see. 
So a lot of times right now, I know here in um, higher ed, we're using these terms of diversity and inclusion. And it's just now it's melting into just a title. Um, it, it doesn't really mean anything. And so I think a lot of times um, institutions are going to be able to capitalize off of these buzzwords without really making an impact and actually doing more harm than good, where we'll see a further disparities, further injustices, where the black and brown students who are already, you know, falling behind are going to fall even more behind because of just lack of access. Um, that could be to technology. So we just assume everyone has a quiet area to, um, you know, do their at home learning or they got someone to make their room a little setup for them that really engages them. But a lot of times you find that these kids are sitting on couches or they're in a the little corner, the, the most quiet place of their home. And so how are we going to make sure those kids are still getting a good quality education? How can you tell a student is learning if their camera's off and you know they're on mute the whole lesson? Or how do you know if a student has to watch their younger sibling so they're actually helping their sibling do their work and they can't even focus on their studies? So that scares me so much because it will defeat the whole purpose of education because it should have been that great equalizer, right? We're giving people opportunities and um, I think that's what's missing. I know a lot of systems are working to get computers and, you know, get tablets in students' hands. And that is great, and I appreciate those efforts, but we do have to think a little bit more deeply about our, what are some of the um, inequities that we can't see, that are not as visible. Um, also, the language learners, people that are um, English as a second language speaker, they're getting significantly left behind because they have no one to help them with their work um, at, as they're at home if their parents are not um, native speakers. How are they gonna you know, be able to keep up with the workload um, it's already so overwhelming, and I do understand that um, people are trying their best, right? Um, this is a challenging time for every single industry. Every industry is trying to juggle, and the education system is, is no different. And so while I do notice that um, a lot of conversations are being had, I just want that justice to not be a buzzword, that equity and diversity and inclusion to really be meaningful things that we're striving for. Um, and the positive thing, I think, will be galvanizing communities to kind of stand in the gap. So like for me and my team, which is my family, we're standing in the gap and we have this idea that is research-based. So we have a, a peer review publication on the efficacy of our STEAM approach. And so it's like, we're standing in the gap with this solution that we have. And what I see is other people are standing in the gap with their solution and like people are getting excited about helping. And I think we do need to get back to the heart of this being taking a village to raise a child. I know it's an old African proverb, but I, I think I'm really excited about seeing that village reemerge um, as different um, even for-profit businesses are offering free services and you know doing little things to help supplement um, some of the struggle, struggles that people are facing. And so I think the positive in that is that a lot of people are seeing, how can I help? And, you know, a lot of people are complaining, but there are some people that are saying, you know, I have this solution. I want to step up and help. And um, I love to see that. You're amazing. You're amazing. Um, this is what I would love to do. Um, we chat with Lee Elberson, who's the chief executive officer of Claiborne Education. And a lot of times he is our go-to resource for us when it comes to education, trends and innovations we're seeing in the space. I would love, if it's okay with you, to reach out to you in the future and, and ask you similar questions about trends and innovation, what's changing in that space. Because I think all the parents that are watching and all the, even if kids are watching here, everyone is, we're in this like nebulous, like gray area where we're at this like, um, like this, it's almost, we're at this like massive crossroads of how we're learning is changing so dramatically. And what I see eventually happening is us learning through screens probably and not in person as much. And if we do that, we're going to need um, these steam kits more than ever because we're just going to turn yeah. into these digital zombies if we don't. I yes. mean, what, what, what <laughs> yes. do you, what... 
Clo- close anywhere you want to go on this topic. Anyone who, anywhere you want to go, any topic you want to cover, Mercy, that we're not, that we're not covering so far. So I want to cover hope, right? So this nebulous zombie, I see it. <laughs> like, I see that people, you, even um, on these Zoom calls that I log into, I see people are drained, they're tired, um, they're exhausted, they're doing the best that they can. And I just want to sprinkle some hope out there um, that we don't have to be miserable during this pandemic. Yes, we do want to be safe, (laughs) wear our masks, and do what we can um, to slow the spread of coronavirus. But what I just want to say is, you know, everyone find something that brings you joy and make sure you're doing that. Um, Rest, you know, I, I, I may seem like I don't get a lot of sleep, but I do. Um, I have an accountability partner that texts me at 1145 each night and is like, are you in bed? Um, And I have to be in bed by that time. Um, But everyone, just try to get your hope back um, during this. Actually, working on Steam Kit gave me my hope back um, during this pandemic. And and being around my family, um, this is actually our family company. So it has given us a a chance to, you know, bond as a family. And that's kind of what we want to other families to do with these steam kits. Like, choose a day that is your steam kit day and, you know, bond over an activity um, and continue the dialogue and the conversation because it's, it's not even going to take um, students seeing me as a scientist. When they see their parent, like, getting engaged and doing these projects with them, I think that will really, really empower them and seal the deal because it's really going to take um, – the families getting back to that first teacher. So I always say my mom was my first teacher, um, but a lot of students um, are being taught by the school system. So I think it's now time for parents to step back in and be that first teacher, um, get the, get their students some hope, and you know try to enjoy uh, the moments that we have to spend um, in community, um, and just be safe about everything. But you know you don't have to be miserable. Is what I always want to tell you people. are amazing. Absolutely amazing. James Watson just put on the on the feed, Mercy Best for President of the United States. <laughs> my aunt, my aunt Charlene always calls me Potus. <laughs> You're amazing. I will hey, I swear, I will reach out to you um, in the near future. Yeah, I'm the editor of the literature in education, uh, specifically with STEAM. So I'm always here as a resource for you. I love what you're doing. And any way I can support, please let me know oh, as well. Same, same. Thank you. Hey, thank you. You killed it. Thank you. Thank you. have you. a good one, Mercy <laughs> Best. She is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Crystal Napier, thank you for making this suggestion. We will welcome her again back on the show. Give it a like, give it a share. We will get to uh, Keith Smith here in a matter of moments. Keith, I want to talk the best shopping centers in Central Virginia. We have Barracks Road in the one slot, the Downtown Mall in the two slot, and the UVA Corner in the three slot. Centers, Quarters, shopping districts, Mercy Best, you are absolutely amazing. We will get to be, we will get to you again. I promise you on this program, Vanessa Parkhill. We will get to your comments here in a matter of moments as well. As with um, Beth Hyder, we will get to your comments as well. Um, Keith Smith, you're right. You have some big shoes to follow right now. So get ready, my friend. Um, Keith Smith is on the line. Judah Wickhauer, let's welcome the distinguished gentleman. Ooh, he's got the whiteboard too. Hold that up there. Look at the screen. He's got a message for everybody from Mercy Best. Hope. Hope right there. How are you, my friend? Uh, I'm done. How do I follow that? When you're in the two slot, when you're in the second guest slot on Mondays, and we have guests like Mercy Best in the first slot, I mean, that's tough, my friend, but you can do it. Well, I've got new toys for you. I've got cleaner. I got that. I've got, I got colors for you for tomorrow, Ooh. so you can see a little bit more. I'm trying to, I'm, we're trying to teach each other. All right, yeah, let me throw this question. You ready for this yeah. one? I am. Keith Smith's top shopping centers or shopping districts or corridors in all of Central Virginia. Well, you called the first one. That's Barracks Road. Okay. I will tell you, though, I think the second one is Stonefield. You think over the downtown mall? I think so. And I think, I think what you're 
not calculating into your thinking is that Costco is part of that sub part of that uh, of that uh, shopping center. So okay. the whole area, it's not just the area where the movie theater is and all that kind of great stuff. You know, I don't, you know, cost, I mean, I know people from the other side of the mountain come here to Costco. I know people in Richmond come up to Costco on that. So I would think if not, you know, I, I think maybe it's a toss up on number two between the downtown mall and that, but pe- that's where people are going. I know, uh, I know what, what's not up there. Yeah. The mall. There you go. So you I got, all right, so I'm doing Keith Smith. You got Barracks Road 1, Stonefield 2, the Downtown Mall 3. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, I'd call uh, Stonefield and Downtown a, a tie. I'd give that okay. a toss up. What do you got, but 4 I, and 5, Smith? What do you got, 4 and 5? Yeah, uh, so I, I would throw out there Designs Crossroads um, area where El Mariachi, El Mariachi is. Um, uh, I would toss that up as a four or a five. Um, we went to dinner there last night, and it was slammed on a Sunday night at seven o'clock. But you know, so Lowe's was packed, Walmart was packed, that whole little subdivision of that that uh, shopping center is packed. And what what's about ready to hit the pike down there? I think you're going to see that come up to a four and five. I think you're getting people from Charlottesville and people from Richmond. You know, I've been doing this for over three decades, and they've been three decades. I've been talking about Richmond and Charlottesville coming together, and that's starting to happen, right? You know, and Har- and Rico's kind of creeping into Louisa. We're trying to we're creeping down into Louisa. So, uh, you know, I, I would we we talk about that all the time. I think Zion's Crossroads is a pretty um, hopping hopping area, and I think that'd be my top. Top three, four. Somewhere Can you make a legitimate argument for everybody that's watching? And I agree with what you said about Zion's Crossroads. I want you to do your best Perry Mason, your best Ben Matlock. <laughs> ben Matlock. I want to give you uh, the best yeah. Tom Cruise in the firm. You kind of look like Tom Cruise from the firm. Uh, uh, you know what? To say. Keith Smith. Say I that. want your best argument for Zion's Crossroads taking over Barracks Road Shopping Center as the number one shopping district in Central Virginia? Well, first of all, I have to believe that to sell it. I don't think it'll be number one, but it'll clearly be number two. And then I'll follow up with, because, you know, you have a young son, because I said so. (laughs) So. (laughs) No, well, it's just, it's just where the growth is, right? It's, 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 uh, you know, look, we talked about this before. It's very complicated to explain, but the divergent diamond interchange that that V dot built there some years ago was done. They they called it. They knew that the volume of traffic coming up and down sixty four and and uh, fifteen was going to be there. But you've got Spring Creek that's got another six hundred lots to go. We we know that there's anywhere between six to eight hundred new single family attached and detached homes coming up in there. We know that the commercial is growing. We know the water and sewer is finally coming up to that. It's just all these things that have been working on for decades is starting to click off. So I'm not that smart. I'm just watching the trends and going, you know, one and one equals two. I'm pretty sure it does. Um, the Zion's Crossroad Shopping Center, which you know better than most. Talk to us about scaling and expansion. Yeah, so the, the, you know the the folks over at uh, Chris Henry and his team are, are are growing that area. There's another parcel that they're getting ready to build on. There's another hotel coming in, coming in. Actually, there's two hotels coming in in that area. So it's just, and they've got the room to grow, right? The geographic room room to grow. So I, I kind of see that. Do you mind if I go back sure. real quick to Mercy? Yeah. So um, you may be aware of this, but your viewers may not be aware of this. On the 28th, this Wednesday, there's going to be a joint work session between Albemarle County Board of Supervisors, City Council, and the UVA Board. So we're going to have the mayor there, Ned there, who is the chairman of Albemarle County, and President Ryan. And do you know what they're going to be talking Tell about? Tell me. They're going to be talking about, they're going to consider a memorandum of understanding of collaboration between the city of Charlottesville, Albemarle County, and the University of Virginia regarding equity, 
diversion and uh, diversity, excuse me, and inclusion. So I would reach out to Mercy and make sure Mercy watches it. It's a public event. You know, it's live. You can, you know, public can attend it. It's a, you know, public meeting like any other meeting. But what they're doing is they are going to have these three 10-ton elephants in the room, and they're going to be having that conversation. And they're talking about everything. I'm looking at the agenda that I just printed out. Uh, they're going to have this to port, uh, this to, this, oh God, I can speak English. We have to get the uh, mercy to teach me how to speak English. Uh, minority contacts, inclusive community assets, COVID-19 cl collaboration. Health, they're going to have a health department report on that. And then this last item, which is MOU. So I'm going to keep a close track on it. Maybe we'll talk about it on Friday in our little outfits we're going to be wearing. Yeah, dude. But, um, Friday. What are we doing Friday? Uh, we're going to get dressed up. Are we going to tell them what we're doing? Uh, you're, it's your show, brother. You tell them what you Friday, want. Friday on Real Talk. Real Talk is an insider's guide to real estate life and the pursuit of happiness. That show airs Tuesdays and Fridays at 10, 15 a.m. on the I Love Seville Network. On that show, we are going to be in full costume on Friday. He's going to be dressed as Batman and Spandex. Think Val Kilmer and Batman. No, 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 do not think, think Val Kilmer, <laughs> Michael Keaton, and Batman. I'm going to be Robin in Spandex. Judah's going to be Alfred. And Liza the Dog is going to be Bat Dog. And, and, and we're going to do the show in full costume. Smith, are you ready for that? I am ready for that. Um, I tried on the outfit this morning. I'm going to go on another. I'm going to do about a couple of 20 to 30 mile bike rides between now and, and Dude, Friday you're not going to eat all week, are you? I'm not going to eat up my my util my foam <laughs> utility belt. I couldn't. I was like, oh man, really? <laughs> so you wanted to talk a little bit about new construction please, later on please, in the show, right? Yes. So um, Crozet um, had 84. This is year to date. Had 84 sales. The other number on the other side is 136. Those are the numbers that are not new construction. So there's a 52 unit difference. Between that, so Crozet, when you take a look at new construction, is really where the, where it's happening. Um, it's pretty hopping over there as far as that goes. Just to give you a difference, new construction was at 55k sale price, and regular sold was 437k. So that's a difference of 118,000, 118,000 dollars. So, you know, new construction as far as ratios go out in Western Albemarle County uh, is really rocking. Conversely, in Fulvana County, it's not quite, it's not the same at all, right? So in Fulvana County, we've got 67 units this year to date that was sold in new construction versus 382. The math difference between the price sales was 34,000. So we had 67 new construction in Fulvana County versus um, 382. So that's a 315 units difference. And the math difference is pretty close. It was 276 for new and 247 for existing. So what you're seeing is in that, in that corridor up in, up in Western Albemarle is where the explosion's happening. You're not seeing it so much in some of these surrounding other other counties. I thought I'd impress. What I thought you did a hell of a job with the whiteboard. Let me hold on. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness. Like people can read. Hold on. Hold on a but second. People can read. You know who we need to give some props to? Is it was it Yvonne? Who's that? Yvonne. Yeah. His daughter. My, yeah. She was uh, to talk about mercy. She was uh, she was teaching a fifth grade. Uh, excuse me, five year olds on kindergarten. With a bunch of whiteboard stuff. So Keith Smith, this question just so, came in. This question came in from Mark. Oh, I'm going to butcher his last name. I'm going to call him Mark S. Mark S. Knoll. Um, where would you open a business if you were trying to have success three to five years from now, Keith Smith? That's a great question. I think I would I would answer it with a question. The question is, what business? Yeah. Right. That's fair. Um, so the fellers, John and Steve, that opened up the restaurant uh, in Crozet, excuse me, in, in Science Crossroads, there was no sit-down 
restaurant and you know they're just rocking it we saw an opportunity we saw a need it took us three years to get there that was three years of hard work so um this gentleman who asked this question is thinking spot on this isn't something you just start today you're going to need a bunch of years so if he can chime in on what business he's thinking i can give him a better um uh, target of where he would want to be in my opinion on that so that that you know, if it's a restaurant, you know, in my, you know, clearly, I think the outer sections of Charlottesville would be a great opportunity. But that, but I think you're reporting there's some some new restaurants popping up locally, right? Yeah, is that not correct? Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, so it depends on the business, right? So Neil Williamson says. What, what, Neil Williamson says, Keith Smith, before we celebrate Wednesday's joint meeting. Remember, this meeting replaces the PACC meeting, which was which was a bi-monthly planning and coordination meeting that had existed since the 1990s. Look, there you go. It's Neil schooling us, man. We love Neil Williams. Gotta love Neil. What's the plan for tomorrow's show? Go. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, why it's now the time to sell, because I think spring market is going to end up having a little bit more inventory than we're seeing at the moment. I don't think it's going to come up to close to the absolute need, but if you're on the fence right now, now's the time to think about it. Now's the time to hire a trusted advisor. And so we're going to, we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit. And then I think we're going to talk a little bit about the insanity that we're going to do on next Friday, because be insane. So. It's going to be insane. We're looking forward to I'm it. I'm looking forward to it too. Keith, my friend, we'll see you in the morning. Hey, thank you, my friend. Thank you, Judah. Thank you, Liza. And we'll talk to you later. You have a good one. Keith Smith, guys, um, the star of Real Talk, an insider's guide to real estate life and the pursuit of happiness. Real Talk airs on Tuesdays and Fridays at 10, 15 a.m. on the I Love Seville Network, a show I very, very, very much enjoy um, sitting shotgun with, with the distinguished gentleman. A couple things I want to talk to before we get to your comments. Put your comments in the comments section. The top shopping centers, the top shopping districts or corridors in Charlottesville, Albemarle County, or in Central Virginia, I think four of them stand out from the rest. Barracks Road, the Downtown Mall, UVA Quarter, and Zion's Crossroads. And in, depending on the order you see fit, Barracks Road, the Downtown Mall, UVA Corner, and Zion's Crossroads. What's in that fifth spot? Is that a clear-cut Stonefield? Is Stonefield a clear-cut in the fifth spot? Stonefield does not have a lot of local tenants because of the high price of those rents. Is Stonefield a clear-cut top five best shopping center in Central Virginia? What are the best shopping districts, quarters, in Charlottesville and Central Virginia, Barracks Road, the Downtown Mall, the UBA Corner, Zion's Crossroads, and Stonefield look like the top five on the program. College football, Miami and Virginia, UVA falls to one and four. Um, a tough loss, 19-14 to the Hurricanes. A close ball game all the way. Virginia football showed a lot of moxie. It welcome its, uh, its, its, its opener, its starting quarterback from the opener week one back. And Brennan Armstrong, Armstrong, two touchdowns, 16 of 30. He did some damage on the ground as well. Um, this is a flawed football team, Virginia football, a flawed football team. I love the coaching staff. I, I bleed orange and blue. I will watch every single one of these teams and stand strong by them. But they do not have the talent some of their ACC peers have. And we are seeing that firsthand as the Wahoos fall to 1-4 overall, 1-4 in the conference. Virginia Tech also took it on the chin. The Hokies, who had climbed into the top 25, lose to Wake Forest 23-16. Virginia Tech now 3-2. Judah, if we could get the ACC standings on screen, you may not have that. Get the next headline about the top 25 on screen. We had five ACC teams in the top 25. We are now down to three of them, Clemson and Notre Dame. And the North Carolina Tar Heels, who got a win over NC State, also an NCAA ACC opponent ranked in the top 25. So three ACC teams left in the top 25. And from a UVA standpoint, the Wahoos have a significant, significant uphill battle. They have North Carolina on the schedule for next Saturday. Um, North Carolina is a top 25 team that has big-time aspirations. That is going to be very tough sledding 
for Bronco Mendenhall's team. He has talent, but the talent disparity is just too large um, this season with what UVA has on the roster and some of its competition. I'll let you know what the line is on Monday. I love to follow the line. Um, I'm calling that up now as we speak. Um, 8 o'clock, UVA, ACC Network, host the North Carolina Tar Heels. The Tar Heels, a six and a half point favorite with the over under at 59 and change. So six and a half point favorite for UNC with the over under at 59 and a half. Before we get to your comments, Washington, the Washington football team beat up the Dallas Cowboys 25 to three yesterday. The East, the NFC East is, is awful. Um, the Washington football team improves two and five. Andy Dalton, Dallas's backup quarterback, started the ball game. He left the contest concussed. The Washington defense played lights out. Callen, Kyle Allen, the backup quarterback, put up some decent numbers. Washington very much in the thick in the NFC East, despite its 2-5 and five record. It just shows you how bad this football team is. Judah, we'll give some love to Scott Wagner of Scott Wagner Integrative Medicine. Dr. Wagner is changing people's lives through chiropractic care, sports medicine, and physical therapy. We also need to let the viewers know how they can save $288 on Ting Fiber Internet. We use the best internet in Charlottesville and Central Virginia, and that's Ting Fiber Internet. You can get the best price on Ting through ilovesevil.ting.com. That is the best price for the best internet possible, only through ilovesevil.ting.com. Comments, put them in the comment section. Anywhere you want to go, I will relay your comments on air today on the broadcast, and there's a lot of comments that we want to get to. We want to also remind everyone that's watching the show, this program is available on every single social media channel possible. We also archive the show on ilovesevil.com. We archive the show on YouTube. We archive the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on iTunes. Majority of folks watching and listening to the show are listening and watching on demand at a time and platform of their choice. We put this show out on a daily e-newsletter that goes out to almost 140,000 inboxes. Um, so, comments coming in. We'll get to them now. So, Neil Williamson, Free Enterprise Forum. Neil, I saw this. Brent Wilson wrote this article on the Free Enterprise Forum. I saw this. I love Brent Wilson, Neil Williamson. The guy is super legit. A Starbucks might be in the works for Greene County. Free Enterprise Forum, one of the many resources we check before going on air for this program. So thank you, Neil, for putting that in the feed, and we encourage everyone to check out the Free Enterprise Forum. Vanessa Parkhill loved Mercy Best. She said, reimagining education. Yes, the ideas Mercy put forward are brilliant. Working with families through boys and girls clubs and densely populated areas by bringing a bus to them is awesome. Please include concepts that will bring those same opportunities to students in rural areas as well, Mercy Best. What a fantastic guest, Jerry. Beth Heider says, Barbara, we have a new conference center um, over on Hillsdale Drive. And she's right. It is a phenomenal conference center. So a couple things I want to talk education. Mercy was amazing. From what I can tell, the future of education is going to be a hybrid of digital and virtual online learning and educators and or curriculum coming to the students. The concept of students meeting at a bus stop or having their parents get in tin cans and drive the bus driver or the parents in tin cans or tin buses driving the students to an antiquated building that costs millions of dollars to upkeep, an antiquated building that has poor ventilation, an antiquated building that is not cleaned at the level it needs to be cleaned, certainly cleanliness and health and hygiene more important than ever in a pandemic. The concept of students riding tin cans to old buildings that are not cleaned appropriately, that are not ventilated appropriately, 
that are extremely expensive to upkeep, this concept is antiquated. Just like the concept of students going to college campuses and learning in old buildings that are extremely expensive to upkeep, staying in dorms that are extremely expensive to upkeep, that are, that are, that are petri dishes for diseases to be spread, those are antiquated thought processes. The future of education is one that most certainly uses a virtual or digital format. But to combat the educational zombies that we're becoming, you see it with your kids, I see it in business, these things are not only an addiction, they're, they're hypnotizing, they're mesmerizing. They captivate your attention so you're not listening to people around you. You're ignoring personal hygiene and health. These things are extremely powerful in the resources they enable us to, to access. But the negative is we're becoming, we're becoming digital zombies. Studio cam for me. You know, one of our, one of our uh, top clients is Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. VMV Brands and I Love Seville, we're an advertising agency. We have the most market share of any advertising agency in Central Virginia. One of our top clients is Scott Wagner of Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. He is seeing now more than ever, his patients are coming in with something called text neck. You know what text neck is? Are you on Studio Cam, J-Dubs? This is text neck. How many of you guys do this? Look at the screen. You're walking, your head's down like this. You're walking with your head down like this, right? Just walking with your head down like this. That's text neck. And we're spending so much time with our head down looking at our screens that it's literally changing the structure of people's bodies. It is changing, they're looking down. They're changing the structure. I've learned that from him. So one of the ways to combat the, uh, the digital zombies is to have learning come to the student in some capacity. And that learning coming to the student in some capacity must be hands-on of some capacity. Must be social of some capacity. Kids interacting with other kids. Kids doing stuff with their hands. Remember when we used to build um, remote control cars? Remember when we used to build Legos and do cool stuff with Legos? Remember the Pinewood Derby in Boy Scouts where a father and son would take a block of wood and convert it into a car and race it down a, a ramp against other Boy Scouts? Remember when we were said, given a soccer ball or a football and said, go play outside and don't come back until dinner? Remember? Now that same thing is video games, social media, and iPhones. It's not go outside and come back at dinner after playing with your friends in the cul-de-sac. I'm terrified what not terrified, that's not the right word. I'm concerned that this generation of kids who are going to be learning virtually and digitally are going to be digital zombies. Not prepared to interact socially. Not prepared to interact from a human-to-human -human standpoint. That's a scary proposition. Curious of your take. Um, so this is the whole concept of the I Love Seville show. We spotlight thought leaders, agents of positive change, big picture thinkers on the program, and we bring that big picture thinking to you. And I think we did that very well today with Mercy Bess um, and Keith Smith. Keith Smith, I love you. I love you, Keith Smith. Um, I think your top shopping centers, Barracks Road, the downtown mall, the UVA corner, Zion's Crossroads, and Stonefield. Interestingly, in that top five, we didn't put Midtown on there. We didn't put Midtown on there in that top five. Receiving votes is Midtown, that West Main quarter. You know what could also be in that top five very soon? Dairy Market, Dairy Central. 
Dairy Market, Dairy Central. I'm curious of how that's going to impact things. Um, all right, I'm out of here. We're back tomorrow at 12.30 with the I Love Seville show. We're also back uh, tomorrow at 10.15 with Real Talk, an insider's guide to real estate life and the pursuit of happiness. This is the I Love Seville show. Find us on every social media platform possible. We feature the best of Charlottesville, Virginia. My name is Jerry Miller. Thank you kindly for joining us. I'd say my top five would be Judah. I would say Barracks Road 1. I'd say the Downtown Mall 2. You know, Zion's Crossroads might be three because they have the Lowe's and Walmart influence and UVA is really, the UVA corner is really getting hammered with the pandemic. We'll close Stonefield with the top five and then Midtown and Dairy Market receiving votes. Maybe you put UVA in the five slot because of the pandemic. Um, but I think Barracks Road, the Downtown Mall and Zion's Crossroads could be a good top three. I don't know, just an idea. What do you think? No, no ideas? I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. That's fair. <laughs>